this is a book on the worst Supreme Court cases of the modern era. Ah, okay. World worst. Okay, and then you're also a, 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 fe a featured speaker. I am indeed. Okay, and then you're going to be talking about some of the cases in that book. Oh, excellent. Our next speaker for the evening, Mr. Robert Levy, is chairman of Cato Institute's Board of Directors. He also sits on boards of the Institute for Justice, the Federal Society, and the George Mason School of Law. He is co-author of the Chip Miller of IJ and the Institute for Justice of The Dirty Dozen, How 12 Supreme Court Cases Radically Expanded Government and Eroded Freedom. The Dirty Dozen is available at Bob's table in the back. I highly recommend it. And actually, I cannot stress how highly I recommend it. you get this book. This book tells in plain, easy to read English language how we got here through the faults of the Supreme Court. Takes cases that you know are bad in the gut and explains it in easy English language that you can also use to explain to others. I highly recommend this book for us to get ten dollars for a paperback that can't even be. Mr. Weeby is also the driving force behind Heller versus DC, the civil rights case on firearm firearm prohibition in DC. His business and legal resume is long and distinguished as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Weeby. Of the Social Security system pointing to the general welfare clause, the power to tax 
in order to provide for the general welfare. And this became a battle between James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton said, the general welfare clause is an extra added power of Congress over and above all the other powers that are enumerated. The power to establish post offices, to coin money, to regulate commerce. In addition, said Hamilton, there is this power to tax in order to provide for the general welfare. Madison said that cannot be the case. The whole thrust of the Constitution was to limit federal power. If the federal government has this plenary power to tax in order to provide for the general welfare, its power is unbounded. Everything can be characterized as providing for the general welfare. As a matter of fact, Madison even went a step further. He said not only isn't the general welfare clause an extra power of Congress, it's actually an impediment, another hurdle for Congress to overcome. What the general welfare clause means, says Madison, is that even if Congress exercises one of its enumerated powers that are in the Constitution, Congress has to jump through one more hoop. It may not exercise even that limited list of powers unless that exercise promotes the general welfare and what Madison then called factions. Mm -hmm. Not factions, not what we today call the special interests. Well, the Supreme Court took a look at this and in a nutshell, Hamilton won and Madison lost. And that opened up the floodgates through which the redistributive state was ready to pour, taking money from some people, giving it to other people without any constitutional constraints whatsoever. And we are now seeing today the general welfare clause invoked as one of the justifications for Obamacare. Case number two about the Commerce Clause, Wickard v. Filburn, a 1942 case. Now there is in the Constitution an express power for Congress to control interstate commerce. The issue in Wickard v. Filburn was this. Does the power to control interstate commerce extend to activities that are not interstate and they're not commerce. Now, if you think the answer to that is self-evident, you haven't been paying attention to the Supreme Court over the past four decades. Mr. Philbert grew wheat on his own farm, all within one state. He didn't buy the wheat, he grew it. And he didn't sell the wheat, he ate it, or he gave it to his farm members. The Roosevelt administration, during the Depression, decided that the price of crops was too low. How do you increase the price of crops? You persuade growers not to produce as much as they're producing, reduce the supply. And so Roosevelt went to Philburn and said, Philburn, you've got to cut back on your production. And Philburn says, under what authority? And Roosevelt said, we're regulating interstate commerce. Philburn quite sensibly replies, well, guess what? It's not interstate. It's all on my farm within one state. And there's no commerce involved. I'm not buying this wheat. I'm growing it. And I'm not selling this wheat. I'm an idiot. The Supreme Court, Mr. Filburn, you just don't get it. If you weren't out there growing that week, you would have had to buy it. And if you didn't eat everything you grew, you would have had some left over to sell. So by not buying and not selling, you obviously have influenced the supply of wheat, some of which hits the interstate markets, and therefore, the federal government can regulate you under the interstate commerce laws. And that opened up a second set of floodgates through which the regulatory state was ready to pull, regulating anything and everything under the rubric of the Commerce Clause. In this case, Wicker B. Philbert paved the way for the noxious notion that Congress could even punish the failure to purchase a product, namely health insurance, from a private company. That is unprecedented. As some of you may know, under current law, it is illegal to buy health insurance across state lines. And so there is no interstate market to be regulated. Moreover, if Congress can mandate the purchase of health insurance, why not the purchase of exercise equipment or a new fuel-efficient car? The individual mandate under Obamacare would extend the dominion of the federal government to virtually all manner of human conduct including non-conduct, establishing a police power that is nowhere authorized in the U.S. Constitution. And that is the legacy of Wicker v. Philbert. Case number three. 
Another case you probably hadn't heard of, but it has immense significance today. <clears throat> 1934 case, Home Building and Loan Association versus Plaza. It's all about the contract clause. The contract clause couldn't be more crystalline. This is what it says in the Constitution. No state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. Now, even that was not clear enough for the U.S. <laughs> Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld a Minnesota statute which, and see if this sounds familiar, postponed mortgage payments for financially troubled homeowners. Never mind the contract. And interestingly, we're now seeing a replay of that. As you know, <clears throat> creditors are being asked to forego foreclosure privileges on subprime mortgages and many other mortgages. And I'm not just talking about mortgages that were fraudulently induced. I'm not talking about just foreclosures where the paperwork was incomplete or inadequate. I am talking about all mortgages across the board where debtors have voluntarily undertaken to sign these instruments with full knowledge of their terms, where the paperwork was complete. These mortgages are <clears throat> being pressured on the part of creditors not to foreclose. And again, the citation for legal purposes is Home Building Loan Association uh, versus Blasdale. Fourth case, about a provision of the Constitution that most people never even heard of. It's called the Non-Delegation Doctrine. The very first sentence of the Constitution, right after the preamble, says, all legislative powers here invested <clears throat> shall be held by Congress of the United States. Now, why did the framers do that? Again, they were very smart guys. They said that because they knew that if we didn't like the laws that the legislature passed, we could vote the bums out of office. Well, suppose, however, the laws that are passed are murky and nobody quite knows what they mean. And then Congress delegates to one of the 320 alphabet agencies in Washington, D.C. the function of filling out the laws filling in the gaps, explaining what it is that they mean. Well, then, of course, the voters have no recourse because these agencies are not run by elected officials. They're run by unelected bureaucrats. And if you like delegation, despite the fact that the Constitution says that all legislative power is vested in Congress, if you like delegation to executive and administrative agencies, then you will love TARP. The Troubled Asset Relief Program, which we know as the bailout which effectively turned U.S. lawmaking power over to the Secretary of the Treasury. First, Henry Paulson, and then Timothy Biden. Paulson initially decided we're going to purchase toxic assets from banks. Within a few weeks, he changed his mind. He said, no more toxic assets. What we're going to do is directly inject capital into these banks. All of this was without any guidance whatsoever from Congress. When Geithner came in to succeed Paulson, Geithner decided it wouldn't be a purchase of toxic assets or a direct injection of capital. It would be a public-private partnership, by which he meant the taxpayers, the public, would foot the bill, the private bankers would get all of the benefits. And along the way, we expropriated, appropriated $180 billion to bail out AIG and a few tens of billions of dollars to bail out the automobile and companies despite an express resolution by Congress that there shall be no automobile bailouts. What have the courts said about this? Well, the Supreme Court said, yes, we understand that the Constitution says in its very first sentence that all of these powers are held by Congress and may not be delegated. But look, we have to recognize that governing is a very complicated business. Uh, and we need the help of these 320 agencies the expertise of these bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. And so we're going to make an exception. We're going to allow delegation of this kind of legislative power to these agencies if there's an intelligible principle that Congress lays down so that the agencies know how to fill out the details. Well, what was the intelligible principle during the bailout process? Nobody knows. At least of all, the taxpayers who are footing the bill. The principle seemed to be make things better. And that is not a coherent principle uh, for legislative.